Well, welcome again to uh, Liberty Church Sunday School Bible Study with Pastor Art. <clears throat> uh, we've been going through a series of study on the minor prophet book, Amos, and uh, we're coming towards the end of that study. So I hope you've enjoyed and been with us uh, during these past few weeks as we've looked at the book of Amos. We know Amos was called of God um, to proclaim judgment against the nations surrounding Israel and Judah uh, back in, in about, uh, oh, 722 B.C., uh, down into about 583 B.C. in that time period. And we know that um, in the last few weeks we've been focusing on the judgment to Israel. Uh, Judah's judgment was light, even though it was condemning because of their worship of foreign gods and their neglecting uh, the word of God. And there's been, in this study, there's been... Uh, a time of, of reflection upon our own world today and our own lives today and how Amos has uh, really judged us. And, it, and it's true as we continue on. We are uh, looking, uh, moving into the eighth chapter of, of Amos. I'll try to get through the eighth chapter today. Uh, so before we get started, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for his blessing. Lord, we do come to you and, and open up our hearts and our minds to the leading of your Holy Spirit. We pray that you do bless our study this morning, that it would have benefit to our lives, uh, and, and Lord, that you would be honored and glorified in this study. And we pray these things now in Jesus' name. All right. Uh, gosh, in chapter 7, uh, we switch gears a little bit from what he had been preaching, and he uh, let us know of visions that the uh, Lord God had given him. And he, we looked at three visions last week. The first one was the vision of locust and how that uh, the locust would come after the, the last harvest and would eat what was left and it basically destroyed the chance of the next harvest. Uh, then we looked at the vision of fire and how destructive, not only how destructive the fire was, but how complete uh, the fire uh, was in its judgment. Uh, the fire was from not only on the grasses and the grains, but also from underneath the earth. Um, so we see that the fires were devastating even uh, to the point of, of destroying or contaminating the water that is underneath the earth. And the last vision we looked at was the plumb line and how God himself uh, proclaimed that he was standing on a high wall and he was the, in the middle of Israel, in the middle, middle of the city, in the middle of, of uh, their capital and God was proclaiming that he was the plumb line. He was the trueness uh, of their lives. And, and he measured everything against himself. And it was an indictment uh, against Israel for their false religion, for their false uh, practices that they did, the deceit that was involved in, in their community of, of weights and measures and and we see that God is the one that's true, and he is the only one that's true. And he's representative uh, by his word. His word is true. And we know that uh, in reading the Bible, that the, the Bible proclaims th to be the Logos, the word of God, the, the true living God. So we, we focused on that last week, those three visions. Now, let's take a look at chapter 8, um, first three verses, we look at the vision of the summer fruit. So let's go ahead and read the first three visions, and we'll, we'll kind of look and see what that is all about. Uh, verse 1, thus the Lord God showed me, behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what do you see? So I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come upon my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore, or I will not uh, forgive them anymore. My mercy is, is ceasing. 
and their songs of the temple shall be wailing in the day, says the Lord God. Many dead bodies everywhere, they shall be thrown out in silence. So he's, des he's describing here a vision of the summer fruit. We see once again that God gives Amos uh, continued judgment upon Israel. And God uses a basket used in bringing in a uh, in, uh, fruit harvest. Summer fruit indicates the last of the harvest or the end of the harvest. Amos and his hearers would understand this to be so, and, and it would be a final harvest of the season. So what's the importance of this vision, uh, and what does it represent? Well, number one, the fruit. Let's take a look at the fruit. It represents a bounty of their labor. Uh, the life they were enjoying was a result of their commerce. Uh, life has been good for them because of the um, ease and, and peace that they were in in this time period because of the battles of Jeroboam II, their king, that went into Syria and, and uh, Damascus and, and different areas. Uh, surrounding Israel and defeated their armies. They were living in a time of peace. The summer harvest, what, it represents the end of their good life. Their bounty is being gathered up in finality. Uh, this symbolizes God's end to compassion and forgiveness upon their sins. He's proclaiming that they have exceeded their mercy, his mercy. And uh, his mercy is, is no longer. He's going to pass by them. And thirdly, uh, the last harvest is one of despair. Uh, a harvest gives us a picture of, of a season end. The process of harvest comes after the cycle of fruit bearing. Once the final harvest had been brought in, as stated here in Amos, there was no more harvesting. It was the final harvest uh, until next season. And uh, we see that, that here is the hope that God has promised through his remnant in Israel. It seems hopeless till next season. And the next season, Amos will announce in chapter 9, the next, next chapter that we get into, we're going to see the announcement of hope. Um, there will be a new day of harvest yet to come. Of course, this message has not yet been proclaimed, and Israel has been left with the end has come for my people Israel. I will spare them no longer, or I will pass them by, what verse 2 said. Verse 3 ends the statement with the gruesome results of the last harvest. Uh, end will bring wailing uh, and mourning, their lavish way of lifestyle, their religious festivals at the temples, the military security, their peace in the city will all come to an end. Death and destruction is what is left for them. Their purpose uh, or response is really a shocking silence. They have no words to say. All right, let's take a look now at verse 4 through 6. Hear this, or hear ye, hear ye, you who swallow up the needy and make the poor of the land fail, saying, When will the new moon be passed, that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath, that we may trade wheat, making the epoch, or a bushel, the epoch is a bushel, a small, make the bushel small, and the shekel, their bartering, their change large falsifying the scales by deceit, uh, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, even sell bad wheat. They have a picture of their commerce, um, the, the, the detestable commerce, the taking advantage of those that cannot defend themselves, that are poor, that are needy, and they're... they're they're um, excessive uh, in their deceit, and we see this. So he starts out here now, a repeat uh, of those called out in chapter 2, verse 7. Hear ye, hear ye. Um, 
and you who swallow up or trample on the needy. Verse 7 of chapter 2 talked about upon the head of the poor and the needy. And he says, and make the poor of the land fail or suffer from want. There's another term, uh, term used here instead of fail. Suffer from want. The wealthy took care of themselves and failed to share with the poor and the needy, uh, causing them to go without. And in some cases, these were placed in a position resulting uh, them to be sold into slavery, to settle a debt that they may have owed. They actually had to sell themselves to, to uh, satisfy the debt. The new moon in, in verse 5 is, represents the passing of the month entering into another harvest time, allowing them to sell their, their corn or grain. And the new moon was a festival time. Things were not to be sold at that time or harvested. The passing of the Sabbath refers to fulfillment of their religious duty, uh, which was like an intermission in their business life. They had to stop doing what they were doing, and they had to wait for the pass, passing of the Sabbath uh, in order to fulfill their religious duty. Uh, had nothing to do with the heart. It all had to do with, with religion. Doing this, allowing the Sabbath to pass, uh, they can now go on with their deceitful practices of their commerce. Making the ephah, that bushel, and, and a bushel is eight dry gallons uh, of, of grain. Making that ephah, small. And, and what they're talking about here is causing the measure of that grain to be less than it really is uh, when they were to sell that grain or take the grain in uh, as, as a, a bartering uh, instrument, that it, they would give them less or show that they are less weight on their scales than what it truly was. Uh, and the shekel, and that's basically what the poor used to buy with, with any coin that they had. The shekels was a, it was a small amount of, of coin, but they made that large. And what it means by making large is they took the shekel, uh, it makes the shekel to buy less grain. And how did they get away with this? They basically falsified the scales that they used to weigh. And that was their deceit false weights. And we see that verse 6, buying the poor for silver. Those that owe too much uh, can be bought for very little. And the needy for a pair of sandals. For those who don't have a shekel, a pair of sandals would do. But they would get the wheat that normally would be thrown out. So what they ended up buying with, with this deceitful practice was not good wheat. It was the, almost the, had the chaff still in it. And it just, it was the wheat that they would throw away. That's what they saved for the poor and the needy. When they did get enough uh, to buy the product, the product was, was uh, bad. And that was part of their practice. So let's see what verses 7 through 10 give us. And the Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their works. Shall the land not tremble for this, and every everyone mourn who dwells in it? All of it shall swell like the river, heave and subside like the river of Egypt. And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the broad daylight. I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like the mourning for only sun, and it's in like a bitter day. Uh, we see an interesting picture here. Verse 7 refers back to chapter 6 again. Verse 8 
when God is swearing an oath by himself using the pride of Jacob as a means of his actions. So the strength behind his own oath is he's measuring up against the pride of Jacob, which was very strong and, and uh, that back in in verse 8 of chapter 6, God referred to himself as his means of oath. And he's doing the same thing here, remembering his oath. God will not forget Israel's works uh, or their bad deeds. The mistreatment, these are the works, the mistreatment of the poor and the needy. Uh, somebody has to defend them. And God is the one that stepped up and is now defending the, the poor and the needy. Verse 8 is a description of a great earthquake again that has been prophesied by Amos uh, that will take place in a couple of years. And uh, we know as we read in history that there was a great earthquake um, about two years from this period, and it was very destructive. And uh, it just fulfilled uh, Amos's claim here, his, his prophesying. Uh, we see that it, <clears throat> it will affect everyone. Everyone will mourn who dwells in the land. Whoever is in the land is going to mourn it. And we know that from our own history here in Southern California. Uh, when we have bad earthquakes, everybody feels it. I recall the one back in 1993, um, the Northridge earthquake, and that was felt. We were living in Riverside, and that's many miles away from Northridge, and it was like a freight train coming through our, our block. We could hear it, we could feel it, and it was very destructive. Uh, it, it was felt for a, a large radius of miles around Northridge, and it destroyed many buildings in Northridge. I remember being on a cleanup crew as a contractor going into Northridge and uh, and trying to secure buildings. Now, it was very devastating. And that's the earthquake that's being described here in Amos. It'll affect everyone, and everyone will mourn in the land. Now, verses 9 and 10 describe the after effects of this great earthquake. Um, he says that the, the sky will be turned dark at noon, and and it's it's a picture of dust and, and f smoke covering the sky, um, and, and the destruction will be uh, represented by the, the morning that they hear. Uh, it may be dark on the land, and the sun's gone out, and the smoke and the, and the dust and the fires uh, will be caused will be the cause of mourning throughout the land. So it'll be a very uh, uh, trying time for those that are here. And Amos is predicting this. Well, let's take a look at 11 through 14. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of the hearing of the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. In that day, the fair virgins and the strong men uh, shall faint from thirst. Those who swear by the sin of Samaria, who say, as your God lives, O Dan, as the way of Beersheba lives, they shall fall and never rise again. Wow. So we see here that God now gives one of the most sorrowful positions or conditions concerning the hearts of the Israelites. He's describing a condition of, of famine. Um, and usually when we think of famine, we, we think of no food. Uh, we think of thirst, no water. Uh, and and we, we think of death in that way. Famines were, were not uncommon uh, in, in that part of the world, uh, especially for the uh, few decades uh, prior to and, and after this time period. Uh, famines would come. The locusts would come. God has just been describing the natural events of the area. But 
What's sorrowful about this condition is not so much the physical famine, the, loss, the, the lack of food and the lack of drink, but it's the hearing and the preaching of the Word of God. He said, that's what they're going to seek for and they won't find. Uh, the Word of God, God is not to be found. And that's, I can't think of a, gosh, a time when we neglected God so great uh, and, and I'm thinking about our times now in our own country, how we're removing God from everything. And I think this is a, a very strong warning for us that it will be like a famine. Uh, we who are, are Christians uh, that are born again into God's kingdom and we rely on the truth of God's word, it's going to be more difficult to hear the preaching of the word as well as to be able to get a hold of, there may come a time where the literature of the Bibles and, and Bible teaching may be restricted, uh, may become illegal to, to preach and own. We don't know. We don't know for sure. But God's warning is true. Is, is, it's a difficult warning, but his words are true. And he says that, you know, God will not be found. It reminds me this uh, searching for the word of God reminds me of Psalm 42, uh, verses 1 through 3. I'll go ahead and read that. It says, as a deer pants, that word means longs, longs for, uh, as man longs for, right? The water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. Here's a picture of thirst. Here's a picture of famine of water, of drink. And the soul of man is, is yearning and longing for the word of God. <clears throat> My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. So we know that, that to the psalmist, God was, was his sustainer. And he was searching for God. He was longing for God and it's a picture of God's not there uh, because of sin. And when shall I come and appear before my God? And there's a question. Uh, when shall I come? How will I know? My tears have been my food day and night. Uh, picture again of the famine and the extent of the famine. And my tears because my soul yearns for the God of this universe, for his word. I need to hear from God. And why they continually say to me, where is your God? And that's our world today. The world is focusing in on the Christians and saying, where is your God? Look at the devastation. Look at the things that are going on in this world today. And they turn and say, where is your God? And I think we need to be careful that we don't sit in that seat and question, where is God? We know where God is, and we know his love. We know his care. We know uh, his sovereignty. We know that he knows all things, and we can trust in God. But as the psalmist said here, my heart is yearning. I long for that relationship with God. So I pray as our country is, is leading down that road of having no God, at least the true God, the God of Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham, our God, our Savior, our Lord and Savior, and being removed from our country. I pray for our country. I pray that, that God will still be the reckoning force that he will be the rudder in this boat. Um, devastating. So verse 13 says, even the strong young people, the virgins and the strong men, shall faint from thirst. Well, literally, due to the earthquake, fresh water and food will be scarce in that day. Uh, not only will the words of God be gone, and it's not a result of the earthquake, but it's symbolic, and the word of God is being removed out of the culture of Israel at this time, as it is our culture. But not only will the words of God be gone, but the land will 
will not produce and the water will be contaminated. This earthquake is going to allow the, the, uh, the, the gases and the steam that are down underneath the earth to come in and contaminate uh, the fresh water that they have above the earth. So we see it's, it's not a pretty picture and there'll be much devastation. In verse 14, um, it talks about, well, let me reread it, and then I'll, we'll, we'll get into the finality here. Verse 14 says, Those who swear by the sin of Samaria, who say, As your God lives, O Dan, and as the way of Beersheba lives, uh, they shall fall and never rise again. So let's take a look at these three areas, these three scenarios. The sin of Samaria. What is the sin of Samaria? Well, in, in that area, in that day, they had a goddess, and the goddess was uh, Ashima. And basically, Ashima was a goddess of sexual immorality. And it was not uncommon in, in that part of the country. Um, we know that um, there are many temples and high places and ashtoreth poles and many forms of worship of gods that promoted sexual immorality, and Ashima was one of them. That was the sin of Samaria. The god of Dan, uh, as we research in history here, the god of Dan was a golden calf. Uh, and, and it just it started back in Mount Sinai when Moses was up on top of the mountain and the people were down below uh, getting impatient and they didn't know who was going to take them out of the land. And Aaron, Moses' brother, helped them make a golden calf. Uh, and it really was a picture in telling God that God was not sufficient. And God remembers these works. Remember, he just stated a couple of verses ago, you know, I swear an oath by, by the pride of Jacob, I will remember your works. And one of those works is to worship foreign gods. And this golden calf was one of those gods. Then the way of Beersheba uh, refers to a ritual worship. Uh, Baal. Baal, we know, is one of the area gods that uh, been around quite a while and, and is, has been referenced many different times. So we see the worship of Baal on high places. Well, there's a promise of God as a result of all of this. And God's promise is that the gods will fail and never rise again. Boy, we need to hold on to that, and we need to pray for that end in our day-to-day, -day, that the gods of this world uh, will fail and will never rise again. God's a jealous God. I'm going to end us here. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the inequity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. We see that in Exodus 25. Well, next week we're going to look at chapter 9, which is the last chapter of the book. Uh, there's destruction that we're going to enter into, and then there's hope. So I hope that you will come back next week and, and uh, look at our final lesson of Amos. Uh, I hope that the study of Amos has been a blessing to you so far. And realizing that God is a holy God, and God's promises are true. God's word is true. And just like today's story about the famine of God's word and those that long after that relationship with God, they can't find God. God is gone. Well, we pray that God isn't gone here. We pray that God is, is still on his throne we know for that to be a fact according to the word of God and that we can trust in that. Well, Lord Jesus, thank you for the time that we've had today. And I just ask that it will be a blessing to the hearer. Uh, pray these things now in Jesus' name.